So welcome, everybody. I'm uh, Nicolas Seidler, policy advisor at the Internet Society. I'm going to uh, moderate this, this panel discussion organized by uh, ISOC and the, the OECD. Um, so today we will uh, discuss about cybersecurity. Uh, li like many other cyber issues, it tends to mean different things to different people. And, uh, well, that doesn't really help when we try to uh, work together and, and collaborate uh, to, to common uh, responses. And in the case of, of cybersecurity, uh, there are many preconceptions uh, that shape this landscape and influence the technical and policy responses to this issue. So the goal of, of this workshop will be to address uh, these preconceptions, uh, these perceptions, and uh, hopefully have a clearer picture of what we should actually be talking about. So to that end, we, we have invited a, a set of very distinguished uh, panelists. Uh, on my right, uh, Alan Marcus, uh, Senior Director, Head of Information Technology and Telecommunication Industries at the World Economic Forum USA. Uh, next to him, uh, Laurent Bernard is a policy analyst at the OECD uh, in the areas of uh, information security and privacy protection. Next to Laurent, um, uh, Lizil Franz is a senior policy advisor in the US Department of State Office for the coordinator uh, for cyberspace. Um, she's not under the preconception that uh, she's a technological uh, whiz, but she has been working on cybersecurity for over 12 years, and uh, she's uh, happy to join the, the conversation today. Welcome, uh, Lizel. Uh, next to Lizel, uh, John Selby. Uh, uh, John is an academic at the University of Macquarie in Australia. Um, John is trying to work out uh, why some things change and others stay the same. However, studying the internet doesn't give him much opportunity to look at things uh, which stay the same for very long. Welcome, John. And uh, next to John, uh, Malcolm Hutty. Uh, Malcolm is the president of the European ISP Association, and he's also the head of uh, public affairs at Links which is the, the London Internet Exchange. Uh, we also have uh, two uh, expert discussions uh, as part of the audience. Uh, Mary Kay uh, Kayo uh, on, on the front uh, seat is a, a security evangelist, uh, and she has spent the last 15 years uh, traveling the globe to uh, uh, trying to help technical, operational, and policy constituents uh, to understand what is meant by uh, the term security. Uh, and we also have, I think, TH and Guyen here. <laughs> Welcome, TH. Uh, uh, she's a legal counsel and director of policy at Artemis uh, Internet. Um, TH enjoys designing human systems to solve human problems. And as we spend uh, more of our lives online, it requires her to read a lot of RFCs and to learn from people who attend uh, internet uh, conference uh, like the IGF. So, um, one last housekeeping note uh, the, the, the about the discussion format. Uh, we will have about a one hour uh, discussion with the panel with a, a, set, a set of questions. The allowed time for response will usually be between uh, 30 seconds and 30 and 60 seconds, so it's very short. Um, and I will actually not hesitate to use my uh, disproportionate moderator's power and wave this uh, red flag if uh, my, my dear speakers go over time. <laughs> <laughs> I hope we won't get to that point. Um, and following that, we'll have a 30 minutes um, interaction with uh, the audience and, and key discussions. So, um, first question. The, the term cybersecurity has been criticized uh, sometimes for being too vague to be actually useful. Is this something that you agree or disagree with? And if you agree, is there any alternate terminology that you would uh, suggest we use uh, in the internet governance dialogue? So anyone would like, would like to, to start? Uh, 
everybody's shy. So welcome, everybody. I'm Laurent Bernard from OECD. So I'm co-organizer of this workshop. Therefore, I should disinhibit everyone. Uh, everything I'm going to say is personal view. So that's for the disclaimer. Uh, no, I think cybersecurity is, uh, as Nicolas said, cybersecurity, we, everybody has uh, an understanding of this term that is different, so that's where the problem is with the term. But from our perspective at uh, international level, in international policy discussions, uh, from where we stand, we don't have a problem with the term. Everyone will use the term, everyone, each country will use the term with uh, which uh, they are comfortable. But if we think in terms of uh, what does it mean more conceptually, um, I wouldn't have a problem with cyber. I would have a problem with security. I think the world security is be has become misleading uh, because what we want to address here is not from, again, an OECD perspective, which is an economic and social perspective. What we want to address is the risk, not the security. Security is not the goal because that goal would be unachievable. You cannot have security. What you can have, is, what you can do is manage the risk, reduce the risk to a level that is acceptable. And when you use the term cybersecurity as being the objective, then that conveys the ideas that you, that you can have a secure environment. And everywhere, cyber or anywhere else, there is no such thing as a secure environment. Hi, John Selby, Macquarie University. Um, from an academic perspective, cybersecurity is a contested term. There's definitely disagreement, um, perhaps more about what is or is not security rather than what is or is not cyber, but still a bit on that. The challenge is different stakeholders promoting different agendas when they use the same term, and that can lead to a lot of technical and policy confusion. So one challenge with this term is if we downplay or exclude certain groups of stakeholders by defining cybersecurity in one particular way, is there a risk those stakeholders will shift their agendas into other institutional forums? So I think, particularly in a multi-stakeholder process, we have to accept that there will be quite a bit of fuzziness about this definition and that's a cost of that process and a feature of that process. Um, I don't think alternative terminology is going to resolve it for all stakeholders. So. That's my position, Serge. Um, thank you, Malcolm Hutty. And again, I'll add these are everything I say today is just going to be my personal views and opinions. Um, I, I, I do think the term can be unhelpful um, because it, the uncertainty and, and lack of consensus about meaning um, can be used to fuzz a conversation and avoid um, reaching clarity. Um, if you think about the term, it, consider the term electrical security. What would that mean to you? You know, electrical security, uh, you can use electrical systems, you can abuse electrical systems to cause all the same kinds of harm that we talk about when we talk about cybersecurity harms. We don't use that term because we, um, most of the time, because we think that, well, electricity is mainstreamed. So do, would we say, well, actually, cybersecurity is something that will go out of fashion as, as cyber becomes more part of the mainstream? And to an extent there, I don't think that the, that can be yes, because the cyber, the cyber side does involve specialist knowledge and specialist skills. And indeed, experts in cybersecurity, arguably, you can say there's no such thing as an expert in cybersecurity, because no, no reasonably qualified expert in the field can be current with everything relevant to what he's dealing with. Um, so, in that sense, I think it can be unhelpful. The, um, the term security itself, I agree with Laurent, um, is very um, loaded. Um, the discussions in Dubai last year at WICKIT um, uh, the around security and introducing security there really showed that different stakeholders had different agendas as to what they wanted to achieve through raising this topic. Uh, and how they wish to use it. Um, when you talk about downplaying stakeholders, I'm not sure so much it's the question of downplaying stakeholders, but it's more the agendas of those stakeholders in certain contexts. Um, but otherwise, I would absolutely agree with that point. I'm going to take a slightly different view um, because I think that uh, cybersecurity is has developed um, a general... Uh, sense of what the concept is, and I, I 
don't think that that's necessarily a problem. I think that definitions are useful when we're trying to um, precisely organize around something that's a little bit more narrow. If you're looking at a narrow uh, concepts or narrow um, issues, then, then definitions are useful for discussing um, how to uh, interoperabil you know, uh, work interoperably with it. But cybersecurity is, I think, meant to be a broad brush of any number of issues that could fall under its umbrella. And in that sense, I don't have a problem with the term. Um, everyone in, in here today, because the title of the workshop was cybersecurity, it wasn't something else. And I think the, the, the notion of trying to come up with another term is, I mean, I'm, I'm, I, I'm not under the, the preconception that I'm a technical whiz, and I'm certainly not under the preconception that I'm an academic, so perhaps I'm um, speaking from a very layman's, term in, ter layman's terms in that regard. So I think if there's a general concept around which there is some common um, uh, usage, some common adoption, and, and, and the flexibility to have um, any number of issues that might fall under it that might require a little more crystallization, that's useful. So there are probably sub-elements to cybersecurity that need that, that kind of tweaking and level of specificity that, that people might be looking for. With regard to risk, um, you know, we are um, absolutely supportive of the risk management um, concept. But I think we have to recognize, in using the term security, it's not absolute security that we can ever achieve. So then that's when the risk management um, concept has to be built in. Thank you. Um, English is not a precise language. We just have to deal with that. So security comes with all kinds of connotations. That's, uh, that's life. Um, I agree with Lisa, at least to the point that it is a generally recognized concept. But I think it's generally recognized by people who are in the cybersecurity world. And they kind of have a general recognition. Um, from the communities I spend a lot of time with, the first thing they brought to my attention, now we'll go back a couple of years, was there's, a, there's a, a big taxonomy problem. Right? If you are a CIO, if you are a cyber expert, if you're a technical audience, we can have a good conversation of cybersecurity. If you're a CEO of a, of a non-tech company, if you're a, a prime minister, if you're the agricultural minister, you, the, these concepts are very complicated for you. And so I think there is some, some opportunity there. Uh, I think security is is too uh, too narrow in definition, and particularly Liesel and, and uh, Laurent both talked about risk. I think it includes risk. I think it includes recognizing that that you don't eliminate risk, but you mitigate it. You build a resiliency, and it's not just in terms of the cyber resiliency. It's making sure that uh, catastrophic challenges uh, to your uh, digital assets are not catastrophic, right? Which is what people think today. So I think it is much more about risk and resilience, and, and, but on the other hand, let's understand that English is imprecise, and no matter what word we choose, it's gonna mean many things to many people, and loaded is, is always a great, great way to think about it. Thanks a lot. Um, so on to, the, on to the next question now. What do you think are the top two or three preconceptions that you or your stakeholder group has regarding the following two aspects of security. Uh, the security of the internet itself as a network and the security of internet users' uh, communications and data. So two or three preconceptions of you or your stakeholder group. Microphone protocol. Um, I guess from a from a policy maker's perspective, um, there are a couple of preconceptions that I think permeate. I don't know that they're mine. I'm not sure it's a stakeholder uh, preconception, but I think it's a general community preconception sometimes. Two, I have two. One is that going in and, and to cybersecurity, some people do view that there is you know one silver bullet solution that can solve the problems. And so a lot of, some people look at it in that 
that vein and try to find the one thing that can fix the problem. So that's one thing. And the other th preconception I think people have, and this will obviously depend on where they sit, but that it's either a technical solution or a policy solution. And one of the largest issues I think we have in cybersecurity is that l lost in translation between the technical community and the policy community. Um, it's gotten better over the years, but um, but it is it still it still um, resides in our discussions um, between those that are um, deeply steeped in the technical issues and know exactly how this all works, and those that are trying to figure it out how to address it from a um, from a policy standpoint. Thank you. So, um, from an academic perspective. Um, we come from many different scholarly disciplines. We have different core assumptions, so we don't all have the same preconceptions in academia. Um, I can suggest some which may be more common amongst academics, but there'll always be those who will disagree with me. So with that caveat in mind, the academic community recognised that many of the design choices that were made initially which helped to, dri to drive the successful growth of the internet as a research tool are also contributing factors to the security risks faced by the internet as the heterogeneity of the interests of its stakeholders has increased over the last two decades. So whilst many of the mathematical and technical models for improved security of the internet have been proposed, the challenge has been ensuring proper implementation of those models by software and hardware developers. There are also limitations to the publicly available record of uh, the weaknesses within those mathematical and technical models, especially in the face of national security agencies recruiting many of our best and brightest mathematics PhD graduates. Um, Quite a few of the people within the academic community were aware of many security flaws for internet users, communications and data which have been exposed by, amongst other, the Snowden leaks, what we've perhaps not done is effect to effectively communicate security flaws to the public. And why the public remained rationally ignorant for so long is an interesting research question. Um, thank you. Um, in terms of pre preconceptions within my own community, that of network operators, you're probably going to be looking at um, factors that result from other sp splits, other divisions within the community itself around other factors. Um, so you will get very much one group that will say, well, when it comes to user security, that's the user's issue and it's nothing to do with us. Uh, we, our job is to make sure that continuing to run the network, the network continues to push bits. And you've got another element of the community that thinks quite the opposite and it is actually their responsibility to ensure an end-to-end -end experience um, that, is, that is safe and that has um, excluded the possibility um, for uh, certain um, bad behaviour um, to the extent that that's um, achievable um, and, and would attempt to um, take um, some quite um, controlling measures so as to achieve that outcome. Um, that I think is just a, a reflection of a broader thing within, within our community that um, permeates into other areas other than security. Um, the technical policy split I think is an interesting point and it, if I may um, use up my time for the second question as well because I think they basically then take them both together. Um, um, I, I, I also see that as being a, one of the key splits between um, technical and policy, um, but it's not just that all the technical people think it's technical and all the policy people think it's policy. On the contrary, um, uh, on, on the contrary, uh, I find that um, technical people often complain um, that policy people think that certain security issues are susceptible simply to a technical fix and the policy measure that is required is to instruct the technical people to bring about that technical thing and we don't know how it is because you're the technical people but just get on with it. Yeah? And, um, and what, uh, often the um, technical people are looking for policy people to develop policy means to address security issues. Um, whether that be in a broader social policy sense um, uh, or indeed um, within a narrow context such as within a, com within a company um, through um, policy and procedures, through um, personnel mechanisms rather than technical mechanisms and so forth. Um, so first uh, I'll just a very quick uh, qualify kind of the stakeholders that, that um, I'm kind of representing here. Um, at the World Economic Forum we deal with some of the top decision makers in the world so I'm talking about um, heads of CEOs essentially or chairmen of the world's largest companies 
um, heads of state or, or heads of government, um, heads of civil society organizations, uh, university presidents, th this sort of group. And kind of on this question, a couple things. One, for sure, there, there is this um, bifurcated kind of uh, concern between the policy and the technical. I'd say most of these uh, people think that it is a technical solution. I, I kind of agree with, with Malcolm's comment that even the policy decision is to ensure that the technical people deliver the solution. Um, but I think there's this, uh, th there's this kind of notion that they don't have a role or responsibility in this. And I, I think that is the biggest and, and the most concerning preconception. If I look at who attends IGF, and I think about the communities, the, the stakeholders I represent, very, very, very few are here. There's a whole economy out there that is heavily dependent on the internet, on digitization, and has no voice or no recognition of their role of responsibility in this space. And so certainly the notion of cybersecurity is something they have to take far more seriously, and there's a giant gap. And so I, I think that's a, that's a big one. Uh, from my perspective, so my, my stakeholders are, are, are more, uh, my constituency, sorry, are policy makers, whether government or uh, across the various stakeholder groups. And, and I, I think what we heard reflects the fact that across um, stakeholder groups, the level of maturity, the levels of maturity are different within each stakeholder group. So at, at, a, at a high level and we see con a consensus is not too hard to get but in order to get everybody in society across each of these stakeholder groups to understand the concepts and and and, and carry them is more difficult uh, so so i think uh, the notion that this is a static environment people would agree it's not a static environment this is a very dynamic environment but when it comes to security they tend to think that uh, as Liesl said, you can have a silver bullet. You can fix that problem. A and, and it's even worse, someone else will fix that problem. And when we come to uh, uh, the CEOs and the management boards and the people who are on the decision-making side of the economy, they think, they tend, some of them, and not all of them, but some of them may tend to think that, yes, someone else, Typically, the techies, it's a technical problem. The techies will solve the problem. And I have, as a CEO, many other technical problems. I, don't, I pay people to deal with that. No, it's, a, it's, a, it's an economic and social problem for my business. It's a question of, of my business succeeding or failing. So it's an economic problem. And to solve an economic problem, I, as a CEO, have to make decisions. And then down the road, it is implemented at technical level through security measures. So again, so I'm going to repeat that many times today, I'm afraid. Again, it's a risk management issues, issue for which uh, security is one part of the solution. Security measures are one part of the solution. Security is not the goal. Security is the means. Security measures are the means. And the problem is an economic and social problem requiring attention from the decision maker on the economic and social side. Um, so that and, and this is far from being totally widespread and understood by uh, the economic and social community at large, whether it's private sector or, or other actors. Thank you very much. Um, that, that, that's, uh, well, that, that was a useful sort of self-assessment of uh, your own uh, community's perceptions of cybersecurity. The, the follow-up question was, uh, what do you think are preconceptions that other stakeholder communities have? Uh, Malcolm always, uh, already touched upon it, saying that uh, usually policymakers think that techies have the solution and techies uh, think that policymakers have the, the solution. Um, would you, would any one of you would like to uh, address preconceptions that you think other stakeholder groups have? Or do you think it's been covered? John? Um, the, in terms of the public um, pre preconceptions, um, one perhaps is that cybersecurity agencies have been focused exclusively on cyber terrorism and cyber warfare, whilst the extent of economic and political cyber offensive capabilities is less well recognised. There's an article just coming through the press this morning about the South Korean Cyber Warfare Command, arrests being made of staff there for uh, engaging in uh, a campaign against the opposition parties during the election. That's just come out in the press. Um, second, the magic bullet solution that's been discussed a few times. I think a lot of the marketing in the tech community 
has contributed to perceptions that perhaps these magic bullets might exist. Plenty of people will promise a magic bullet, whether they can deliver it, it's an entirely different matter. Um, and that also, particularly in an Australian context, strategies which might be effective in offline contexts, such as border controls, are able to be effectively translated to the online environment where the advantage between attackers and defenders may be very different to the offline environment. Thanks for reminding us of the follow-up question. Um, I guess I, I would say that uh, follow a pick up on the comment that stakeholder group, each stakeholder group or perhaps subgroup within uh, stakeholder communities um, might all think it's somebody else's problem to solve um, and sort of miss the point of what I think we talk a lot about is shared responsibility across the um, community, whether you're a user or a provider or a government or a, um, a business person, everybody, and depending on what part of the, of the of cyber is yours, whether you're a vendor or a user, uh, or an individual who's uh, blogging. Um, there's, a, there's a concept of shared responsibility, I think, that is missed when you think that, when you uh, might think that it's somebody else's problem to solve completely. I'll, I'll give uh, just maybe two anecdotes, and I think it kind of expresses a bit of, of, of an answer. One, um, a CEO uh, stood up in a session that, that I was involved with and said, okay, so I know when missiles from another country fly over our territory and blow up my, my data center, I, I sort of know my job is not to fire missiles back. Like, I, I know my job is not to create an umbrella over it that I rely on my government to respond to, to such an attack. But when my data center is destroyed uh, through some sort of digital attack, I, I actually have no idea who to call. I, I don't even know what I am supposed to be doing and working with uh, to prevent this from happening. So I thought it was just, a, again, at, at a senior executive level, this, this very open uh, statement they made. Uh, the, uh, the other statement was something along the line of, uh, um, it, it was a board meeting, actually, at a US-based company, and uh, they make medical devices, which are connected um, digitally outside of the body, not necessarily to the internet, but, but to some other machine, which of course is connected somewhere uh, to the internet. And they were concerned about uh, people using this technique to maybe kill people or, or steal intellectual property or, or anything of the like. And uh, the chairman of the board basically said, well, it's okay, you know, we're, we're working with the US government, we'll be protected, they'll, they'll ensure that, uh, that our property and, and our our concerns are, are mitigated. Um, this is a company that sells more stuff outside of the US than sells inside of the US. And they never once understood or, or, or uh, thought through what happens when these uh, challenges that they're worried about happen outside of the territory of the US, who actually is accountable to help them, and can they even really depend on the US government to, to do this? So when I hear those sorts of stories and kind of look people in the eye, you can just imagine how much deeper these these uh, gaps in understanding are. Thank you. <clears throat> well, I, I think there is another widespread misconception, and I'm, I'm, I'm not sure which across which community it's the most widespread, actually I do have an idea, uh, is that security is always good. Whatever the kind of security, more security is always good. And when you see it, again, from an economic and social perspective, of course, you need security because without security, you don't have trust. And without trust, there is no economic and social interaction. So you need security. But if you have a sec too much excessive security, you fall into another problem, which is suddenly you co it conflicts with privacy. And people are thinking they are monitored, surveyed, so they start taking less risk because the confidentiality is, is breached, right? So they take less risk, which, is, which means less innovation, uh, less initiatives, less creativity. So security is good in as much as it, it is balanced. Uh, and, and of course, there is a community which thinks in terms of security is always good, and that's the national sec security community, and that's 
I mean, and we are happy that they have that role because we need also national security. But the problem is, how does the balancing exercise take place to ensure that national security view of security, which has to be there, is balanced and doesn't lead to too much security that then uh, leads to inhibiting economic development because some measures will uh, prevent people from or, or reduce the incentives to, to be more creative, etc. So that's really an issue. And, and one way, again, to, to balance too much security versus uh, not enough security is to see it from a risk perspective, which means understanding that um, uh, security is not the objective. There is a level of risk that you always have to accept. It, you never have full security. You have to accept that level of risk. Sure. Just to, just to add another element of the sort of too much security aspect is um, certainly the, the synergy between security and privacy, but also the synergy between security and functionality. Um, you know, everybody makes it, that's part of the risk management uh, decision that any enterprise, whether you be government, company, organization, needs to make as they're determining what their output is and how they're going to protect that, but how they're also going to enable use and functionality. And that's where the risk management piece comes in as well. I'm going to have the red flag soon. Uh, but just to add on that, I, I just mentioned privacy as one dimension, which necessarily at some point, if there, is, if there are too much security controls, will conflict, but you have many others. You mentioned one, functionality, convenience, usability, but also freedom of speech. Uh, uh, and pretty much all the other dimensions will, if there is too much security, suffer. So, so it's really a matter of balancing security versus all the other dimensions. Thanks, and, and actually we'll get back to the notion of balance, trade-offs, and actually the notion of also shared responsibility that you mentioned before. So these are all, uh, all elements that we, we are going to get back to. Um, one element that uh, also Laurent mentioned is the notion of trust. So what do you think, uh, what elements need to be put in place to ensure that all internet users, uh, including uh, citizens, but also companies and governments, have confidence in the internet, uh, as has been said, uh, uh, confidence and trust in the network is a key requirement to um, have a vibrant internet for economic and social growth. So what elements need to be put in place to uh, uh, make sure that there is this confidence? Um, so the, the first is we need more cooperation between all the stakeholders. And I think that starts with uh, the ability to share information that in many cases right now is actually prohibited, uh, particularly in, at the corporate business level where a lot of concern uh, lies. So you know, some people might call it safe harbor or something like that where uh, uh, companies can actually share information with each other, can share with governments, can share with, with others to really uh, understand more of the threat and be become a more resilient type of organization. So I, I think that's certainly one. Uh, a few incomplete uh, suggestions. First is accurate stakeholder expectations about the extent to which the internet or any aspect of life can be free from risk, getting those expectations right. The confidence that people have in the internet is rapidly shattered when unrealistic expectations crash against actual events. Um, Secondly, broad and effective education about risks and how to minimise them. It's an eternal task. Third, the ability to make informed and varied choices about a variety of internet parameters, including privacy, so empowering stakeholders rather than having a one, one model to fit all internet stakeholders. And fourth, uh, effective democratic oversight of both public sector, national security agencies and private sector entities um, to help th with that balance as has been discussed. Wow, I don't have a um, bullet checklist of all the things I want to put in place. Um, but from a more practical level of dealing with the risk, I think it's about the risk management is what I would like to come back to. And the element that I think that people of all stakeholders 
want to see in place is that it's essentially the elimination of infinite variables. Um, basically, risk should be something that they can mitigate. If it's just pure uncertainty and they don't know anything about what they're exposed to or anything about what they should do if something goes wrong or how to respond, then that's not a secure environment by any, by any understanding of the term, and it's not an environment in which you're going to feel at all comfortable. So you're looking for how do you ensure that risk can be managed, how can you ensure that it can be mitigated. I mean, just coming back to your, um, Alan's example about uh, missiles flying overhead, um, one of the key threats in this space, the threat to confidence, is that you can be subject to attack and not know where it came from or where to turn. And the, um, all the um, protection that is realistic is um, for most people and for most stakeholders, nation states being the possible exception, um, is purely in the line of defensive security, okay, protective security, making sure it doesn't happen in the first place. And that is very limited. But in terms of being able to turn around to your government and say, can't you do something about this for me? the confidence isn't there at the moment because you don't have the confidence that government can even um, attribute accountability um, for, for attacks that have taken place in a way that they can then, that they can then pursue or will be willing to pursue. And, and that is a major problem. I guess I would um, add two elements to the discussion. One is um, communication. I think John mentioned it. Um, communication of your um, your aims, your goals, your terms of use, say. Um, so the more information that users have, the better they are, the more empowered they are to make their own choice about whether or not w to pursue um, their, their search or their um, interaction online. Um, so that's certainly one. And then the next one I would say is that it, 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 is, an er it is a medium in which um, there is a constant development and evolution of best practices and, and, uh, and behavior that um, users come to, come to expect as they have their interactions online. And if you don't go along with what those best practices are, then you will not be you know, utilized in a way. Um, and I think there's, uh, that's an, a social sort of social developmental um, uh, acceptable use kind of uh, norm, I guess I would call it, that um, that I think is <laughs> continually developing. Yeah, I think cooperation is a very essential key word here, and it, it, it is not just cooperation, say, uh, public-private cooperation, that's absolutely essential, but it's not just public-private, it's cooperation within the different uh, silos in governments. Uh, it, it is cooperation at between the national level and the international level. It is cooperation across private sector players and private sector within private sector, civil society and uh, and business uh, and the internet technical community, etc. And it's also cooperation uh, from the technical level to the policy decision making level uh, in in both ways. So it's really a key, a very important keyword. Uh, it, and, it, and it deals with sharing information, uh, that's absolutely true, but it's also before that perhaps dealing with sharing views and understanding in order to build this, the, the uh, sufficient level of uh, trust uh, for at some point sharing information. There is a Three Musketeers uh, a slogan, uh, uh, one for all, all for one, and I think uh, we are not going to achieve anything in that space. Uh, if there is not a shared, uh, a, a shared culture, a shared understanding that this is all about uh, everyone having sharing some responsibility according to their role, and I'm quoting here the OECD 2002 security guidelines, uh, and that's a very important concept that, that leads naturally to the multi-stakeholder model. Um, but I think there is another key word that, that's important to have here, which is transparency. Perhaps transparency is, is a cross-cutting theme that if, if, if you put it in the discussion and people start to understand they have to play under that rule, then it helps. 
Thanks. And actually, the, the, the fact that you mentioned uh, cooperation is, is a very nice transition to the, to the next question. So um, where does the responsibility to, uh, for addressing internet security issues lie? And can we actually, uh, how can we most effectively combine efforts uh, from different sectors? Pass the mic. Um, internet security needs to be addressed by all stakeholders, neither supply side, demand side, or regulatory side uh, can solve these securities on their own. All stakeholders need to, in particular, better understand the incentives and goals of other stakeholders so they can more effectively communicate with each other. Uh, governments, industry, and civil society could effectively combine to fund a larger volume of interdisciplinary research. Um, self-plug here, self-interest, uh, by academics to accurately collect empirical evidence which will better inform policy debates and to accelerate the development of new models for internet security. So that might be one solution. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I think we're all gonna say everyone, but I, I just wanna make sure when we say everyone, everyone, every citizen, every employee, every business, every organization, every government, every silo within government, everyone has got a responsibility here. And I think until we all recognize that, I mean, it's in the same way of, if you think in terms of physical security where, where one lives, right? People who live in neighborhoods that don't feel responsibility tend to have higher crime rates. They tend to not know their neighbors well. They tend to not be a community uh, versus communities where people do know each other, where they do take pride in understanding and working together uh, where they're cooperative with law enforcement, they tend to be lower crime. And so I think there's, there's not much difference there. We all need to recognize we have a responsibility. I guess I would just come back to the concept of shared responsibility that I mentioned earlier. And, um, uh, and combined with uh, communication about where, you know, sort of one area, one person's... Um, part of shared responsibility bleeds into another person's. And that level of communication is really, um, re really key. We had a um, uh, exercise in the US to discuss bot combating botnets. And one of the biggest parts of that discussion was that it's not the responsibility of just one part of the community to address this issue because it it's permeates across the spectrum. Um, of uh, providers, users, um, not just the ISPs, not just the application providers, not just the users, but all in this sort of spectrum of, uh, of the world that is, um, uh, that are exploited by um, botnets. So it, that kind of conversation, I think, has to occur more often. Um, yeah, I think I have not much to add. All participants are responsible according to their role. The problem is to get that message across down to the very thing. My grandmother is a, an internet user, and uh, and the CEO, and the um, uh, minister, and all stakeholders. Really, all of them. So at some point, we need to capture that simple concept and disseminated across society and it's a challenge with this concept the, the second the first principle of the 2002 security guidelines so some time ago uh, was awareness raising if you not, don't have awareness that there is a problem you're never going to feel responsible the second principle is responsibility so really that's uh, at the core okay okay so um now, we, we've, uh, it's been mentioned before that uh, the notion of uh, balance can be, can be quite central. So um, how could we actually strike a reasonable balance between, on the one hand, um, a nation's interest in protecting the security of their citizens, and on the other hand, the citizens' rights to privacy, freedom of expression, access to information, freedom of association? And actually, should we talk about a balance, or can we maximize all these elements? Tricky question. Uh, 
Okay, maybe I'll start. There's a lot of fear up here, I think. Um, so, I, first, I think there are generational and cultural differences, as we see around the world, between what things people want to keep private and what people want to leave open. I think security is necessary no matter what you want private and what you don't care about being private. There's still always a security uh, necessary. So I think balance is, is achievable. People always say or, privacy or security. Why can't we say and, privacy and security? I think the minute we start saying that, we start thinking about how to solve that. I think it's quite possible. Um, but there are, in anything, trade-offs. And I think that came up before. When, when one thinks about risk, it, it is about trade-off. It is about function you know, versus, uh, versus risk. And sometimes you're willing to take the risk because the opportunity is just so great. And sometimes you're not. And I think these are, these are cultural and societal challenges. And, and I don't think there's one answer to all. Uh, just sort of a, an anecdote that always reminds me in, in this discussion, um, if you've ever been to the Serengeti or anything like that, um, in the rainy season, the grasses are really quite tall. And if you watch animals, it, they're really quite fascinating. Um, if the grasses move, gazelles run. They just take off flying as fast as they can. It doesn't matter what caused the grass to run, uh, to, to move. In the dry season, where the grasses are really quite low, gazelles will walk right past lions just sitting there with no fear at all. And it's because they understand more what's going on when they can't see things that they don't. So things like transparency matter. And I think that's a big key to, to the balance. I think this is an ideologically loaded question. I think this is written from the point of view of someone that prefers certain values over others. Um, I do believe that the listed values here, um, citizens' rights to privacy, freedom of expression, access to information, freedom of uh, association, can be maximized. I don't think it needs to be balanced. I believe that you could have a view of security that says that what we are seeking to do is to maximize these values. Um, I believe that this, I, I see this list as being from someone that prefers the values and would see that uh, basically take an, an individualist view of um, fundamental rights uh, and that would see that the job is to try and um, maximize the individual's autonomy um, and that the secure environment is one that allows them to do that while respecting everyone else's autonomy um, and that that's a perfectly valid objective which is shared by many people. But there are also other values as well. Um, there are those that think that no, well it's all very well this, but I would rather prioritize shared cultural norms. Protecting my society from being influenced by other cultural values, by protecting my government from being exposed to threats of um, the lack of confidence that is created when unhelpful or unfortunate information comes to light, those sorts of things, which are not individualist values, they're collective values. And if you share those, um, then you'd have a very different interpretation of this and probably um, a very different approach to the security measures that you undertake. Um, so I would answer this question by saying, yes, you can certainly do that if that's what you want to do. But there isn't necessarily a worldwide consensus that that's the aim. Um, I'd just like to refer to the um, U.S. International Strategy for Cyberspace, Prosperity, Security, and Openness in a Networked World. One of the core tenets of that is Internet freedom, supporting fundamental freedoms and privacy. And we commit to help secure fundamental freedoms as well as privacy in cyberspace by supporting civil society actors in achieving reliable, secure, and safe platforms for freedoms of expression and association. And our policies in this area and many others have not changed. Well, it is a loaded question. Um, I think there is, there is a shared understanding at the highest level and um, uh, at the social level that um, we want to maximize these, uh, all of these dimensions, of course. But there is a 
technical, I, I don't want to say technical, there is a, just a, a fundamental reality that when you secure something, you create a boundary around it, you create a perimeter around it, and that's going to reduce the openness of that something. So if you have an environment which is completely, say a field, an open field, and something on the field, and you want to secure it, um, you're going to put a perimeter around it. And suddenly there is less flows between that thing and the rest of the world in the field. So security inherently, in order to protect, reduces the flows and reduces the uh, dynamic nature of what it is protecting. Because any change in what you want to protect will introduce uncertainty. And uncertainty is a source of risk. Right. So if you really want to secure it, you have to reduce uh, uncertainty. And so yeah, well, we have to uh, maximize. That's the objective. But the reality is that any security measure will reduce um, uh, the, uh, the openness and, and, and the, inform the capacity to change and the information flow. So at the end of the day, if we're talking about information, so at the end of the day, um, uh, that's the problem we have to, to, to solve. So we need, there, there is a discussion on balance. It's not really, should we maximize our balance? We have to balance <laughs> in, in the real world. The question is how you balance. And there, what you, what you said is really interesting because there you will have, I know that the question does not uh, refer to the internet or to information world. But your question is formulated in very general terms. So what you will find in the digital world is just a reflection of the culture you have in the offline world. That's all. And, and uh, it's not different, in, in, and there is no reason why it should be different online from offline. And we'll face the same problem when we discuss this, this, these points online as we face them when we discuss them offline. Okay, John, would you like to say something? Um, one issue that's not been mentioned here is the question of power. And security can provide power to some groups in society if they benefit more from that security than other groups. So, in particularly in democratic states, the issue of the um, oversight of security, the effectiveness of that oversight, the effective communication of that oversight to citizens and their voice in that process, I think is vital to ensuring that the the balance, if you want to have a balance of these perspectives, doesn't provide or lock in power for certain groups in society at the expense of others, particularly in the long term. So I think the, um, the danger is, particularly if you design into infrastructure particular designs of security, um, they can be locked in and through network effects be very hard to remove if a society later on believes that there needs to be a rebalancing. Thanks a lot. Um, so we've reached the end of the, the first section of uh, the discussion. I think we, we've had some quite fascinating uh, points from all, all, all different speakers. Uh, before I uh, open the discussion to the floor, I wanted to get back to um, our two uh, key experts in the audience, Merrick and TH, um, are there specific aspects of the discussion that resonated with you or any issues that you wanted to, to highlight uh, based on this uh, discussion? Do you have a mic? Thank you. Merrick. Yes, there's actually quite a few um, things that I was thinking about or what would be the most poignant to this group. One is that um, for some reason people think that security in the physical world is easier than in the virtual world. And really they're both the same. And for some reason people think that in the virtual world you have to have as much absolute security as possible, but that's not even existent in the physical world. And when people think about, you know, okay, the overreaching cybersecurity, what, what does it mean? It does mean absolutely everything. And when you, when you talk about it, I think that's the assumption. But when you ask somebody, well, how do you provide your cybersecurity? Then it starts getting really complex because it deals with physical security to the devices, 
host security, network security, application security, and in so many different ways that when you get into the intricate details, that's where things become complex. And I think that's something where we do absolutely have to have the intersection of the policymakers, the technology folks, operational people, and I do not mean the network operations people, but basically how do you do your, uh, um, how do you run your businesses? What are your enormous business operations? And a fourth factor, which is law enforcement. And I will have to say that in the last five years, you know, I have seen a lot of collaboration between all four communities, which I think is great. Um, so that was one of the um, statements I was going to make. Another one is Marcus uh, brought up the fact of data sharing. And the criminals are really good at sharing data. We are not, right? And we keep talking about what's well, a privacy issue. And I ask people, well, what is the privacy issue? Well, it's a privacy issue. And then I want to get into more detail. In today's world, what do we mean by privacy? If a criminal can get access to data fairly easily, why are we trying so hard to protect it in the name of privacy? So maybe we have to reconsider what is meant by privacy in some places. Those are my comments. Thanks a lot, Merrick. Very, very insightful. Um, TH, uh, also the same question. Are there specific aspects that you felt resonated with you? Yes, hi. Um, so I want to actually go back to the first question, which was the definition of security, because I think some of the responses I was, you know, I noticed that maybe your definition of security was a little bit different. Um, so it was very interesting. The question about, I believe it was um, Laurent. Laurent mentioned that you can't have perfect security. That's not ideal. I think the basis of that may be that you see security as more traditional, that there's this boundary, right? You're keeping assets away from other people. And so if you have a world of no risk, um, perfect security, then that means no sharing at all. Versus I think Mr. Hutton, his definition may be less traditional and it's, it's more the risk management framework that you know, security is really the optimal boundary. And so I think maybe you two are actually aligned, it's just that your definitions of security are different. Um, the, 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 the second point I wanna mention is with respect to Liesel, thank you. The shared responsibility. There was a lot of talk about shared responsibility which is really interesting. I come from um, a company that is trying to make security kind of no-brainer for consumers. And our thesis is that the market is sort of broken because consumers, you know, normal people, and I work at a security company, I'm a policy person who reads RFCs, still hard for me to decide what do I do when a certificate warning is displayed to me? You know, I, I, and I work with guys who are experts on this and I ask them all the time. And I still don't feel capable of making this decision. Um, I've, I've been taught don't click, so. Um, but it's, it's really hard for consumers, and yet we place on them breach notifications, right? We want to be transparent, but is that, should that be, should that, does that really reflect the reality? So the analogy I like to think of is, in the US at least, we don't place the burden on tenants to know how to fix their own apartments. And this frees me up um, as a single renter to be able to move around at will and just follow my you know, career passions. I don't have to think about, oh my gosh, I have to upkeep this home, I have to go to Home Depot on the weekends, I can't even take care of a plant, right? So um, it's, it's really interesting that in the security space, we, we put that burden on consumers without asking, is that the right way to do it? And my last point is I really like Mark Alan Marcus's comment about community and membership and having, if you give people skin in the game, then they'll help the community to flourish. They'll help to you know have a neighborhood watch. Um, and this is a plug for what we're doing is that we're thinking about this a lot and we're applying for a top level domain. We're actually going to be a security self-regulatory program that's tied to a top level domain. Crazy, never been done. Um, and the idea is to use this top level domain called .secure 
to claim a neighborhood on the internet that is secure. Consumers for, for consumers, the idea is for it to be no-brainer. For businesses, for registrants that register sites on .secure, we would say, hey, before we actually put a space in this neighborhood for you, allow you to have a shop here, you're going to abide by these policies, a collection of RFCs, that the industry, which we've galvanized, says this collection is going to make the website the safest on the, on, on the internet and still you can make money. Um, and then on an ongoing basis, our technology platform would use software and human cops to patrol the neighborhood and ensure that, you know, that there is continual compliance with this set of baseline policies which will be upgraded to keep up with uh, the latest attacks. Thank you. Thank you very much. This, it's been very interesting. Uh, unless some of you would like to react, two points, okay, please. And please, uh, I mean, you've been very patient. Prepare your questions. It's coming. <laughs> Thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to clarify uh, the point. I think we agree. I was just uh, commenting on cybersecurity. And to me, the problem with security is, is that it is generally understood, and, and there is a, a technical reality that you have to put a perimeter. But, Taking that into account, what you really want is to manage security risk. So we actually do agree, but in order to manage security risk, the security measures you put in place are going to, you're going to have perimeters, you're going to have limitations of flows to some extent. The question is where and how much, and, and, and what defines where and how much, and which measures, is the risk management process. It's not a security decision to decide, I mean, technical security or organizational security decision to decide where and how much you put perimeters and security measures. It's a risk management decision because it will impact the way business operates, the way the activities are going on. It will reduce them to some extent. So, so, so the problem is when we use the term security as a noun, like we need security, we want a secure internet. When we use it like this, there, all of these nuances go, go away. And we suddenly want every, something that is just a, a, a problem that is solved. It's never solved. There is always some, some level of risk that has to be accepted, which is why I would support to always say, but nobody will do, uh, but not security, but security risk. The point is risk, and it's risk in the area of security. Um, thank you. I just wanted to uh, mention two things. Thank you for raising the um, level of, I think, increased cooperation and collaboration that's happening across um, sort of all the stakeholder groups and in, in, in bringing up law enforcement, because that is a, a key element of the, of the um, equation as well. Um, and secondly, I just wanted to mention that um, we talk about shared responsibility purposefully. It doesn't mean equal responsibility for each element of the, of the spectrum. Um, and so it's important to figure out where exactly, what those responsibilities may be in any given situation. But that's just kind of an important distinction I would make. And then, um, yes, I do think we have to talk about what level of expectation is put on the user, whether they're an individual user or they're an enterprise user or whatever it is, and it's gonna vary, right? Um, but I think we won't always wanna think of it as a, as a burden, but introducing the notion of choice for the users so that it's not, Im it's not an imposed level of um, security uh, uh, or, or protection measures that are put on an individual, they still have the element of choice. Just okay. concepts to think about as you're thinking about what that sort of um, picture looks like. Thanks a lot. Uh, so now we have about 20, 25 minutes of interaction with the audience. Great, I see many interested people. Uh, maybe we can take uh, two or three questions uh, at a time. Uh, I think at the back, um, P please introduce yourself and uh, go ahead, thanks. Hi, uh, my name is Alex. Um, I'm quite new to cybersecurity and I was a bit confused by the session. I came here to learn about cybersecurity. 
And so my question is, what is it actually that we are talking about securing? Thank you. <laughs> Thank, back, back to the basics. Um, maybe just one, one or two more questions. Um, could you pass the mic? Thanks. Hi, thank you. My name is Ki Chang Kim. I'm from OpenNet Korea. Um, I would like to have the panelists' opinion about how useful it could be to draw an analogy between offline security and online security. I think in the offline security, the power and resources for ensuring security tend to be monopolized. We have military and we have police force. Not many countries tolerate private militia or self-defense units. Um, but this sort of monopolized resource and power to ensure offline world, would it work in securing online security? Do we want some sort of converged, monopolized, centralized unit which will take the vast burden of ensuring security. Some countries talk about setting up cyber warfare unit uh, in the hands of some military or central intelligence service. But as John mentioned, I'm from South Korea and this sort of cy cyber warfare command could often turn out to do more damage to their own people than protecting their people. So I would like to have a panelist view about how useful it could be. And can this monopolized and centralized security model work in cybersecurity? Thanks. I, I think we will take those two questions now. It's, it's already two very interesting questions. So um, up to you. Malcolm? Monopoly, taking that first. In the offline world, we don't have a monopoly for the state on security measures. I lock my door. Most of what we do when we're talking about security, certainly in the private sector, is actually about protective security. So we're, by extension, it's a version of locking your door, putting the burglar alarm in, all that sort of stuff. When you start, when you raise the concept of a um, centralized body that has force, you're actually talking not about defensive security, you're talking about offensive security. You're talking about somebody to go after the bad guys and do something about that. That's a different topic, and it's, and it is indeed more in the realm of the sort of cyber war type stuff, but on a more mundane level, there's regular investigation of any crime that happens, whether it's online or offline, and that continues. And the jurisdictional challenges within in the online space, um, because things happen across borders so readily, are well, well understood to be a problem, and there's cooperation being worked on that. Um, but to be honest there, I don't think that there is anything really that radically different in this space, with the exception of the point that I raised earlier, which is the problem of attribution. Basically, the investigation is so much more difficult. Um, going back to the first question, what are we talking about securing? There I think it's going back to the original um, issues that we were having about um, you know, what does security mean? What is, it that, um, what is it that we're talking about here? And there, I mean, Alan started the discussion by saying actually he thought that the term cyber security was reasonably well understood. And I conditionally agree with that, but only depending upon context. Um, if you get a bunch of chief information network security officers sitting around a table and say, hey guys, what's been your big issue this week? You know that they're going to be having a conversation pretty much on the same terms. They're going to be understanding the bounds of that conversation. They're going to be understanding the kinds of things that they want to talk about. It's going to be a productive conversation. You get together a group like the IGF together with all the breadth of stakeholders there and say, um, let's talk about a secure internet. And it's not, in my opinion, a terribly productive conversation because their definition of what they want to achieve from that is just too varied. There are just too many differences as a starting point. 
Um, a couple of points. The issue of cybersecurity, people talk about are we securing things connected to the internet? Are we securing the internet itself? Are we securing uh, you know, a wide range of things? And as you know, we talk about the, the internet of things in the future potentially, that will grow broader and broader. So the, the sort of separation between cybersecurity and security may collapse a little bit over time. The second one, how useful would it be to um, sort of have a centralised system for security? One big difference between, say, the telecommunications traditional space and the internet space is between top-down regulation and bottom-up regulation. And I think that creates one big challenge for any sort of centralised security body uh, because they would not be able to respond quickly enough to development by individuals somewhere on the planet of a new protocol or a new software application or a new piece of hardware. If you had to get approval from that centralised body before you could release that out to the world, it would destroy innovation on the internet. So centralised security, I would argue, is not going to be particularly effective. Um, one other thing I would draw back to a historical model, um, the state monopoly you were talking about. Um, one perspective that I've talked about with a number of um, governments at times is the, um, the idea of investing in one big strategy. The French Maginot Line in the Second World War is a classic example. It's the perfect solution to the previous war's problems. But changes in technology um, meant that France could not withstand attack in 1939, 1940. So the, um, a zero-day attack took down that defensive line. The, uh, the German uh, paratroopers that went in by gliders and landed in a Belgian fortress, the Ebene Mail fortress, and took it out from the inside. That was a, a zero-day attack in the physical world. So the concern is if you build a centralised system you can't keep it up to date with the changes in the technology. It'll be too slow to respond. So I would argue that's an, uh, not a, an effective solution. Um, just an element to add to that is that, you know, we talk about um, the inter internet as being a distributed, decentralized network of networks. So I can't imagine that any centralized form of security would be effective. Thank you. Uh, what are we securing? Um, from our perspective, we are not securing. We are trying to make sure that the infrastructures that provide society with energy, water, education, health, uh, food distribution, uh, transport, that these, these can continue to be effective and even further develop and be more effective. This is our problem. This is the problem we're trying to achieve. Actually, I'm just focusing on some, but it's, a, it's, it's actually not just infrastructures. It's a question of people's interaction in their daily lives. It's a question of business operating. It's a question of pretty much all the facets of society today. They should continue to uh, work and they should to, to function and they should continue to develop and improve. This is the problem we're trying to achieve from an OECD perspective. Uh, and, and, and managing the risks that these face is in the, a digital environment, for us, is cybersecurity risk management. Um, the central uh, monopoly security thing, the words here uh, lead to what Liesl says. Uh, this is a completely distributed environment which needs flex flexibility. It's totally din dynamic, and if you start losing this, then you lose all the economic benefits that go with it. Now, um, there is a collective dimension to addressing this issue, and there is, a, uh, a say, a more granular individual dimension to solving these issues. The collective dimension is going to be addressed according to the culture of the country. And, and some aspects will be more, more centralized inherently, some will be more distributed. Uh, we still have the individual. Uh, everybody has a role, as we said, and shares some responsibility. Uh, on the collective aspects, uh, 
it needs to, whatever is in place needs to uh, uh, keep the flexible nature of, uh, of the environment and, 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 the, uh, and the openness and the uh, capacity to, uh, for information flows to, to, to go uh, in, in, in all directions. So that's the problem with a, with a monopoly approach and a, and a, and a centralized, centralized approach. It tends to be static and to see only part of the problem, not everything. Um, but that's a very conceptual response. I mean, it's a conceptual question. It's hard to generalize on that topic. So societies create laws, and uh, part of those laws are to protect things we think are of value, whether they're digital or physical. We want to protect them. To me, that's the, the analogy, online versus offline, um, and what we are securing. So th just one point, security has a factor in it called time. You know, we lock our door. Do we put on a burglar alarm? It depends. What are we protecting, and for how long do I need to protect it? So we separate enforcement of that law that society created from ensuring that you know, we're not being infracted upon. And, and that's just time. So what are the right tools, centralized, decentralized? Well, what's the time factor that we need to protect against and pick the right tool? Thanks a lot. We have 15 minutes left, so it's, it's very short. Um, do we have remote moderators' questions? OK, no. Uh, Marika, you wanted to say something very quickly? or? And then we get to the second rounds of very short questions and very short answers. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I, I've helped so many people actually secure their infrastructures that I want to make a comment uh, from the first question that said, well, what are you actually talking about? And really, the first thing is you have to figure out, you know, in your environment, be it a government, being a business, um, you know, what, what is it that you are using on the internet, right? And what is it important to you to protect? Because you're protecting the data, right? It's all about the data and the information that's on there, whether or not it's in transit or whether or not, you know, it's addressed, it's in a backup somewhere. And what you have to start going through is uh, you know, that if somebody has access to this data, right, is my company gonna go bankrupt? Am I, as a government, going to, you know, have big issues, political issues? Right? And, and starting from data classification is really where the, you then start looking at, well, how many ways can people get access to it in a virtual environment? Right? And then, uh, then it becomes hard because you have to look at all the details. And so, but it starts with actually what are you trying to protect, which one of the panelists also brought out. Thanks a lot. So. Ten minutes left. About I'll take three, maximum three questions. Uh, someone here. Thanks for your patience. Thank you, uh, Venetia Blackman, Australian Taxation Office, Melbourne, Australia. So, if we agree that the online world is simply an extension of our offline world, then we also accept that the concept of personal risk management is the same within these two environments. However, I would assert that the concepts that citizens need to understand to manage this personal risk in an online environment are very different to those in an offline world. So my question to the panel is, in a society that is, broadly speaking, seeking easier, more user-friendly digital experiences, and where the individual is the ultimate decision maker in terms of personal risk, and a risk management strategy is as strong as its weakest link, <laughs> what advice do you have on how that dialogue with the broader community in relation to risk and reward in an online environment can be enhanced and expanded to allow citizens to better assess their own personal risk management. Thanks a lot. Any other question? The gentleman over there, I think, raised his hand a few times. Thanks. Uh, Nacho Kitani, Microsoft. Uh, actually, uh, one comment and uh, two short questions. The comment is we are not protecting only data. I don't agree with this principle. When we attack the, you know, uh, processes of companies, etc. It's not data that attacked. It can be much bigger. Um, but the, the two questions I have, uh, very short. One is, in, in in protecting critical infrastructure, when we talk about critical infrastructure for countries, in many cases we're leaving the de the decision of that protection to the, you know, the, the CEOs of those companies, and don't you think that it has? It's actually a policy decision, not a CEO decision to protect whether it's utility, transportation, et cetera. Because 
they're, they're not looking at that, for the, in many cases, they're looking at it from you know, their own company, I would say, not from the country level and the impact of the country level. And I think there is, there is an opportunity to look into it from a policy perspective, what it means. So that's my first question. And the other comment I want to make is, we, we talked a lot about, we looked at security from a protective uh, sort of things, which uh, what I, I look at it, I did from a, another angle, which is a sort of a life cycle issue. We are protecting ourselves, but at some point of time, we know there will be an attack. So the question becomes, so how do we detect it? How do we solve it? And how do we, how do we recover? So it's not just about you know, how do we protect, but actually it's a sort of a life cycle. And, and I would argue that attacks will be always there. So the question is how really how we detect and how we recover is, is, is another element of the discussion. Thanks a lot. Um, I know many people will be very frustrated, but these are already two quite broad questions. So um, I think we'll close the, 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 the open questions. And if the panel could answer, and if possible, uh, again, quite, quite concise. Thanks a lot. Yeah, all right, I'll, I'll start. Um, None of us would probably leave our wallet on the park bench when we go for a run. We, we recognize that there's a risky behavioral element to that. And so taking on personal risk in the, in the uh, sort of internet or online space, we have to have that same set of diligence. It's interesting when you watch children grow up and the risks they're willing to take and what they learn from that. And, and they do that by testing, by finding that there's some bad things and also from learning from, from others. And I think in this space, it's, it's not different. The first is there's a lot of new tools, there's a lot of new capabilities that are happening rapidly, and we're only now learning about the, the risks that, uh, that come, the personal risks that come with that. Um, we saw the same thing in the financial meltdown, right, in 2007. People took risks that they didn't quite understand, and we've learned from that. We're gonna have those sorts of meltdowns, and the faster or the, the more velocity occurs, the more of those types of issues will happen. It's nice as a parent to try and protect your children from everything that they'll do wrong. Um, and it would be great if government and other institutions could do that for us. But the reality is we're, we're going to have to test a lot of this ourselves. And it's gonna be painful at times. And some people will get you know, hurt more than others, but that is the nature of learning as a society. And so I think we'll, we'll see a lot more of that. Um, it, it's interesting, and, and I'm quoting, I, I think, an ITU uh, number that something like 92% of critical infrastructure in the internet or digital telecom space is, is owned by private sector. The private sector has a responsibility, and, and I think that's a challenge. How do we make national policy against critical infrastructure if most of it is private sector owned? Um, I, I don't have a particular solution to that, but I think we do need to recognize it's easy to say let's have national policy but execution is in the hands of the people that run this. Unless we're about to nationalize infrastructure, which is a whole nother uh, debate, I think we just need to understand that the, there is a, a challenge. Um, well, the, the, all, all these infrastructure that I mentioned that, f that enable society to work are not the only, I was just making the point that this is not about securing the internet, it's about making sure society works and continues to prosper. Uh, um, uh, and, and it's, again, not very different, taking from your question, it's not different from the uh, uh, offline world. There are many fundamental, I mean, almost all fundamental infrastructures that enable society to work are managed by private, private sector. And, and, and in sometimes there is some degree of regulation because there is a collective dimension uh, to, to that. So government says, well, hold on, you know, it's not just your interest, it's the nation's interest or the people's interest as, as a whole. So you should do this and that uh, to make sure it, it all goes well. And that's not different because there is bits and, and, and it's digital. This is going to be the same debate. Difference is that it's going very fast, it's very new, and there is a lot of immaturity in approaching it. And it takes generally years and generations to acquire the culture that enables to approach all of this from a policy and from a technical perspective in a, in a, in a consistent and coherent manner. Uh, this is going very fast and we see the threats increasing and the risk increasing, putting everybody on pressure. Sometimes wrong decisions are made because there is an emergency and people want to do something. So we are facing all of this. It is the process of getting more mature in that space. It'll take years. 
it's a multi-generational issue. Um, the, the question on the, I'm not sure the citizens uh, and, and the individual responsibility is different online than offline. Again, the difference is nobody's mature enough. It, it is very new. We are in the infancy of this. It, it, took, it took how many years to get better at road safety, make sure that people fasten their seat belt, that kind of stuff. Uh, at some point, legislation had to step in. Uh, and I mean, and, and that experience is different across countries. Um, it's the same here. I think, uh, uh, again, it's a multi-generational issue and start with awareness raising. It starts with approaching it from the right perspective. And again, when I see the marketing of some companies or the, some politicians saying, we need a safe and secure internet or that product is gonna make you secure online, no. That's not true. We will never have a safe and secure internet, and that product is not going to make you secure. So that's a completely biased approach, and that's not helping the multi-generational uh, challenge of improving the culture. And it takes time. Um, I think I'll also take the first question um, to start, because I think it really is grounded in awareness raising, um, which is um, in, in, in exact science. <laughs> It's a difficult art and it requires collaboration and investment and a will at sort of the, you know, of all the parties that are involved. In the US we have a, um, uh, campaign called Stop, Think, Connect, which is a public-private partnership. It brings in many of the, um, stakeholders in providing for, uh, internet and internet types of services and, um, the government in its and raising awareness for the citizen for our citizenry and we also work with um, other countries to co coordinate and collaborate on building out awareness on a global basis as well all of it can be done there can be more done in that area so I think that it's just something that if if the that's the goal then there needs to be that investment and I think that that's something that we should aspire to um, the second thing with regard to critical infrastructure, I'll also be parochial for a minute and talk about the sort of the U.S. government's approach. Um, Early this year, uh, President Obama issued an executive order for um, cybersecurity and a, and a uh, companion presidential privacy, like presidential policy directive uh, for cybersecurity in the critical infrastructure. And it represented sort of an evolutionary process of how we deal with our critical infrastructure in what we call a public-private partnership. And I think it's a little too stark to say um, that all companies that run critical infrastructure only care about the company. I mean, they in the end have customers, they have um, uh, a reputation, and they also have um, a mission and a goal to provide for that critical service or that critical good. So it, it's not entirely um, true to say that all they care about is the bottom line, because if that's gone, they don't have a bottom line. Um, so that partnership is, has been very, very important. And the executive order um, lays out a, a direction for how government agencies um, work on cybersecurity and how they work together with, uh, with industry. So the, it, and it involves information sharing, cybersecurity information sharing with between the government and the private sector. And it also calls for the development of a cybersecurity framework that identifies and implement, that to identify and implement better security practices among the critical infrastructure sectors. So there is a um, recognition that sort of a top-down um, uh, mandated approach is not, uh, it's back to my, just to go full circle, back to my silver bullet, it's not gonna, it's not gonna achieve, um, you know, in one fell swoop, uh, the, the solution. So, um, that collaborative effort of building best practices, coming to the consensus about what kinds of standards might work is, is sort of the goal of those two efforts. Thanks, John. Uh, actually, we'll cons consider that as final statements because <laughs> we've reached the hour. So, uh, John and Malcolm, would you like to say any last words? Do you have actually any preconceptions that you are going to 
throw out after this discussion. <laughs> um, well, I was going to say one thing in relation to um, the question about how we enhance the dialogue that might serve as a sort of concluding remark. Um, we need a bit of modesty in this space. I, I, I see that question as being related to um, the point raised from the key discussant about, I see this certificate warning, what do I do about it, how do I know? And we don't have good advice, and we don't. But actually looking at that as an example a bit further, we don't even know whether certificate authorities are a good way of, of helping people. Yeah? There is real reason to suggest not that this is a poor security practice to have security certificate authorities. And yet it is a key mechanism that is relied upon and needed. What I think this little example shows is, is that we just don't know. Yeah? The idea that we can, um, that it's just simply about education, in a trivial sense, you know, of course we all work together, we all cooperate, we work to help um, deliver good messages to consumers and to individuals and so forth. And that's in a, in a limited sense. But in the broader sense, stepping back for how we are going to deal with this in the future, we have to recognize that, that there is a lot that we don't understand about this field. We are not at the stage of road safety, of saying, well, we've got cars now and people need to know that they need to look both ways before they cross the road and we need to have a big campaign to make them do that. Because many of the things that we may be saying may turn out to be bad choices, yeah? with the best knowledge from the state of the art as it currently exists at the moment. And so that, I think, goes to the, um, the question of excessive security and excessive controls. And, I, and to be honest, in my opinion, there's no such thing as too much security so long as I get to define what, my, what security is. Um, but I think we can all agree um, that you can have such a thing as too many security controls. Yeah? And in this space, you can have inappropriate controls, whether they are, and that includes messages out to others about what they should do, what they should use, how they should behave. And we have to recognize that it's possibly, um, you know, we need to take, uh, and this is my pitch for a risk management approach, we need to, take, to look at what we're trying to achieve and find ways of getting by in the world and managing the problems and threats that we face in a way that is good enough, not by attempting to achieve a secure outcome because we don't know even what, not only don't we know what that is, but we've got no idea really about how to get there. But what we can do is try and protect ourselves, mitigate the risks that we're exposed to, and be open to continually learning and changing. Thanks a lot. Um, actually, that, that's an excellent final way to, to conclude the session. I hope it's been a, an interesting discussion for you. I would like to thank the key discussants and our panels, uh, and thanks the audience for your, your participation. And let me thank ISOC for taking care of most of the organization of this. <laughs> I have no credit on the organization. Thank you very much, Nicola and Christine, who couldn't come yeah, today. Thank you.